As part of these hometown hero recognitions, we often do it for one of two purposes. One, to recognize someone who has displayed extraordinary courage, strength, or we do it to recognize an individual who has displayed extraordinary impact on our community. And my hometown hero, Sandra Rank, displayed both. Two years and one month ago, her son, Mitchell, died of fentanyl poisoning. I want you to just take a moment to soak that in, especially if you are a parent, grandparent. Imagine the moment you find out that your child, who had a whole life in front of him, was taken from you. If you can take that, that thought of going through that grief, losing and burying your child, and somehow channeling that anguish, that grief, into something that can make a difference. Sandra Rank and her family have dedicated themselves for the last two years to educating, providing awareness, and hopefully making a difference within Brown County and statewide on the impacts of fentanyl poisoning. I don't know what it takes for someone to be able to get up the day after losing your child and say, I'm going to make a difference from this, but Sandra Rank has done it. It's for that reason that I nominate and am incredibly thankful that she is with us here today. I would ask you to join me in welcoming Ms. Sandra Rank. Thank you, everyone. Um, as you can imagine, this is a courageous conversation for me to have. Um, I'd like to introduce you to, oh, first of all, thank you for the award. I, I'm really humbled to receive it, but in full disclosure, the reason I accepted it was because I can be in front of you collectively today. I spent the last two years doing a lot of homework, and I feel like right now, if I could sum this opportunity up in one sentence, it would be intelligence, presenting to power. So what I would like to do is share with you what I have learned in the last two years. This is our son, Mitchell Rank. This is his daughter, our granddaughter. We are raising her collectively with her other grandparents. 25% of children raised in this country today are being raised by their grandparents because of drug abuse. Mitchell died of, when Mitchell died, we gave the phone to the, pol his, the police. What we learned from that is I thought Mitch died of a, an accidental fentanyl overdose. Mitch didn't die of an accidental fentanyl overdose. Mitch was addicted to fentanyl. So what I want, that particular discovery sent me down a two-year rabbit hole in which I have learned more about, I could teach a PhD course on fentanyl. I'm gonna to try to keep the last two years and all of that information to five minutes for you. What I'm going to boil it down to are things that I have observed by walking. I lived fentanyl for a year. I'm living fentanyl right now with some other people in my life. I met with all of the people, Brown County, anybody associated with a drug overdose, I've met with them. 11 overdoses, a year of sheer hell. I want you to think right now the scaredest you've ever been in your life. Like, just think about that for a moment. Like for me, when I'm super scared, I can taste metal every single day for the year that he was addicted to fentanyl. That's what our family felt like. So when you have these fentanyl overdoses, it's not just the person. It does a lot of collateral damage. Here's what I've learned. And these are courageous comments. Um, they're nonpartisan. They may not be something that you want to hear, but I hope that you will consider them because they are real. One of the other things I've learned in this journey, which brought me to my knees many times, 
You have to meet people where they are at. You cannot meet them where you hope they're at, where you want them to be at, where you think they should be at. You need to meet them where they are at. And this fentanyl crisis is mind-boggling. First thing I learned is, or th my thoughts are this, should fentanyl be classified as something other than a drug? And these are all considerations for you to think about as you journey through how you're going to help our community with these with the legislation that you're passing and the money that's coming to our state from the opiate crisis. Should fentanyl be considered a poison? Should it be considered a war chemical? Every single time a, a young bystander, I have, this is a call I had this week, 17-year-old going to a, a dance, smoking a joint, laced with fentanyl, overdosed, top in her class, and then perfect ACT scores. If her friends wouldn't have called, she'd be dead today. When people are, people don't set out to become addicted to fentanyl, they are inadvertently exposed to it, and then they become. So if we have, if, it's, if it, it could be classified as something other than a drug, the penalties would be different, the whole procedure might be different. China is literally rotting us from the inside out with little tiny bombs that they're putting in all of this illicit, these illicit drugs. And where the courageous comment in this is, kids, young adults are smoking pot. They just are. Do I agree with it? No. Do I do it? No. But guess what? They're doing it. And when they can't buy it in a dispensary where it's free from fentanyl, we are, we're saying, hey, babe, take a chance with a, it's Russian roulette with a, a police officer told me, Russian roulette with a three-quarter loaded gun. Two years ago, 25% of the pot in, in Brown County was laced. That's two years ago. Every statistic I tell you is something I've learned from law enforcement. So it's a consideration, do we reclassify it? That's a thought. It's a consideration, how do we look at marijuana? Again, meeting people where they're at, not where we hope that they're at. Secondly, task force. I know task force, people have a lot of thoughts about task force, but right now, the people that are fighting the fentanyl fight are grieving mothers. Do you know that the equivalent of a 747 crashing every single day is the amount of people dying from a fentanyl overdose? It's 300 people a day in our country. And we have grieving mothers fighting the fight. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of power, but geez, we don't know how to do this. We need people with intentional eyes, intelligent minds, looking at this full time, all day, every day. That would be something to consider thinking about. Thirdly, education. Oh my God, if I've learned anything, here's a perfect story that will explain it to you. I was at a wedding overlooking a restaurant. There was a, rest, there was a fire truck, police, station, or police officer, ambulance. Three people are walking to the window, myself, a seven-year-old, and a 12-year-old. We get to the window at the same time. Seven-year-old says, oh my gosh, I wonder what happened. And I, not thinking I'm by a seven-year-old, said, well, somebody probably had a heart attack, choked, or overdosed. Seven-year-old, What's an overdose? And I'm like, oh, God. 12-year-old. An overdose is when somebody takes too much of a bad medicine and they die. Seven-year-old. Why would anybody do that? 12-year-old. Addiction. That's why they would do that. Seven, I'm not saying anything. Seven-year-old. What's addiction? 12-year-old. Addiction is when somebody takes takes that bad drug, and they need it like they need oxygen, and then it kills them. And in my mind, this was in November, I was like, ding, 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 ding. There's the opportunity. The opportunity is teaching our people, not Narcan. I mean, Narcan's important, but the opportunity is we don't, they don't become addicted. The opportunity is they aren't exposed to fentanyl. That is our ace in the hole opportunity. A couple of other, so like people will say, well, we tried education. One pill will kill. You know, what is it? Just say no. We don't need a slogan. We need actual education. An example. Do any of in here you know what, why we don't have functioning fentanyl users? We have functioning alcoholics. You can be a functioning meth person. You can be functioning cokehead. You could be functioning a lot of drugs. Why can't you be a functioning fentanyl user? 
because when you use fentanyl, it completely slows your heart rate down, and this is literally what you look like. You can't stay awake. You can't keep your eyes open. There are no functioning fentanyl users. It is a 100% death rate. Telling, teaching kids, how do you overdose on fentanyl? Does anybody in here know how, what that looks like? I can guarantee you our teenagers don't know what that looks like. An overdose from fentanyl, what happens is when you take it, within seconds of you taking it, your heart rate down, slows down so slow that you literally, it's called nodding out. You, go, you lean forward or you lean back. You suffocate. That's how you die from a fentanyl overdose. How much fentanyl kills you? Look at the tip of your pen right now. The tip of that pen knock you out dead. Kids have no idea what they are saying yes to when they're saying yes to trying anything. This type of education is what we need to be teaching them, not a slogan. We need to be super real with them and teaching them the truth. Another opportunity that we have is detox centers. Right now, if you have a loved one that needs help with fentanyl, you're toast. There's, in our state, there's nowhere to go to. There aren't detox centers. There is nowhere. You're on your own. We lived it. I have, peop I have people that are living. When people call me and say what to do, I'm like, I, my child died. I don't, obviously don't have the answers. We need detox centers because the second they say, yes, I want help, they need to have somewhere to go. The other opportunity that detox centers provide is a holding time where they can have two or three days without the drug. Fentanyl has such a short half-life that they go into withdrawal really quickly. So detox centers are something, and one of the hospital meetings that I was at had this idea, and I thought it was brilliant. They said, like in Brown County, we have Unity Hospice Center. Why don't we have like a unity detox center where we fundraise collectively as a community, as hospitals, and we have a detox center? Brilliant idea. Lastly, we need to be honest. We need to talk about this. There are so many issues in communities. I get it. I'm in, I've been in real estate for 28 years. I, I, there, let's face it, I'm gonna swear, it's a shit show. There's a lot going on, right? Nothing is more important than the drug, of the deaths that we're facing. Talk about a workforce shortage. If we don't pay attention to this, this isn't just, this, a lot, everybody's dying. Your kids, your grandkids. I guarantee you, within a couple years, you're all going to be touched. It will be, as my husband says, coming soon to a theater near you. This is no joke, people. It is a leading cause of death, 18 to 49. So my plea for you is this. I'm here to help. I'll do whatever I can. You all can call me. I will, I, I could talk for hours, right? I will stop now. But we need to do something. And doing nothing, which is kind of what it feels like we're doing, yeah, that's a decision. And it's not the right one. As Joe said in his last, the last little bit of his little speech that Joe was just on before me, being a community is a collaborative effort. I know we can figure this out. I know it's hard, and the stopping point for a lot of people is they're overwhelmed, and they're like, what are we even supposed to do? Well, we figure it out. And when you have, like, ma major complex issues, how do you figure it out? You Lombardi it. You break it down to the basics. Absolute basics. We can do that. We have the information. We, why we're not doing it, I have no freaking idea. So anyway... Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for all that you do to help build our state. I really appreciate it. Thank you.